misfiring guns, an assailant claiming to be Jesus, and a president who continued speaking despite a bullet wound, from Andrew Jackson to Donald Trump, here are all the presidents who have survived assassination attempts. In the early 19th century, no US president had faced a serious threat from a constituent. That changed in 1835, when a homeless house painter named Richard Lawrence aimed a gun at President Andrew Jackson during a congressional funeral. The gun misfired, sparing Jackson's life. Enraged, Jackson beat Lawrence with his walking cane. Lawrence attempted to shoot again, but misfired, and before a third attempt, he was quickly subdued by the president's aides. Even after the incident, Jackson remained troubled, suspecting that Lawrence might have been sent by a political rival. Given the controversy Jackson was generating at the time, this seemed plausible, though Lawrence likely had no ties to Jackson's enemies. The assassination of Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theatre near the end of the Civil War remains one of the most tragic moments in United States history. However, that wasn't the first attempt on Lincoln's life. In 1860, the election of a known abolitionist to the White House was a source of massive controversy, causing tensions between the northern and southern states to reach a fever pitch. President-elect Lincoln was due to assume the presidency in early 1861, and after a touching farewell to his home state of Illinois, he hopped on a train to Washington with a scheduled stopover in Baltimore. What Lincoln didn't realize was that in Baltimore, a man named Cipriano Ferrandini was planning to murder him. Luckily, the terrorist plot was foiled by police detective Alan Pinkerton, who warned the Lincoln family. Lincoln wanted to stop in Baltimore anyway, but his wife convinced him to skip it, leading to the Lincoln family hiding out in Washington's Willard Hotel until Lincoln was finally inaugurated on March 4th. William Howard Taft wasn't the most famous president in history, but he was the first US president to meet with a Mexican president, then a former general named Porfirio Diaz. Considering the not-so-pleasant history between both nations, this was a pretty big deal. The celebrated USA-Mexico crossover in El Paso, Texas, was accompanied by lots of glitz and bombast, including a parade with 2,000 US Army soldiers and more than 2,000 Mexican troops. Despite the presence of the military, some guy wielding a pencil pistol broke through the crowd and tried to murder both presidents at once. The would-be assassin was taken down before he could do anything, but he managed to get within a few feet of his targets. Even though Teddy Roosevelt successfully completed two terms by 1909, the politician ran for a third term in 1912 and gave a big campaign speech in Milwaukee. As Roosevelt stood up before the crowd, a barkeep named John Schrank shot a bullet at Roosevelt's heart. Insanely enough, the speeding bullet smacked right into the bundled papers of Teddy's speech, which he'd stuffed in his breast pocket earlier, as well as his glasses case. The bullet still lodged in Teddy's chest, but the speech paper's glasses case combo had significantly slowed down the bullet's momentum. So what did Teddy do? Roosevelt just continued giving his speech, as if totally unfazed by getting a bullet in the chest. He even ripped the bloodied papers out of his pocket, held them before the crowd and announced, You see, it takes more than one bullet to kill a bull moose. After the speech was done, Roosevelt rushed to the hospital for treatment and recovered, while Schrank spent the rest of his life in a mental hospital. I do not care a rap for being shot. It is a trade risk. From the start of his presidency, Herbert Hoover was at risk of being assassinated. And before the month was out, someone did try to murder the new president-elect. Later in November, Hoover set off on a goodwill tour of Latin America, hoping to spread a message of peace to our southern neighbours. But not everyone felt so peaceful. A man named Severino Di Giovanni and his allies felt the president-elect's visit was a perfect opportunity to get revenge on the United States. Once Di Giovanni deduced that Hoover was going to ride a train from Chile to Argentina, he arranged to have explosives planted on the railroad tracks. The plot was discovered, and the bombers were all arrested before anything could be put into motion. As for Hoover, he appeared remarkably undisturbed by the whole hullabaloo. President Franklin Roosevelt faced many unprecedented challenges. As if both the Great Depression and World War II weren't enough, he also suffered from polio that left him paralyzed from the waist down. Throughout all this, FDR's policies, courage, 
and stability have led to him often being celebrated as one of the most important US presidents in history. But it all could have ended tragically on one day in 1933. Down in Miami, the new president-elect was giving a speech to a massive crowd. Amid the record flock of 25,000 observers slunk an unemployed man named Giuseppe Zangara, who'd just purchased an $8 pistol. According to later reports, Zangara said he had no problem with FDR personally, but claimed he hated, quote, all officials and anyone who is rich. As soon as Zangara had a clear shot, he screamed out, quote, too many people are starving, and fired six rounds at the president-elect. A bystander intervened, and he missed FDR. I knew he was shooting at the president, so I take my right arm and push the pistol up just as hard as I could. His bullets went through five other people, including visiting Chicago Mayor Anton Kermak, who died from his wounds. The crowd swiftly took down Zangara and might have killed him if a calm and composed FDR hadn't told them to let the authorities handle the assassin. FDR went on to devote his presidency to ending the Great Depression. Attempts on the president's life became increasingly common in the latter half of the 20th century, and Harry Truman had to deal with two tries. The first came knocking on his door in 1947, when a Zionist group called the Stern Gang sent multiple letter bombs to the president, rigged to explode when the envelopes were opened. Before any fatalities could occur, the White House mailroom snagged the letters and had the bombs defused by the Secret Service. Only a few years later, Truman faced another murder attempt. At the time, the White House was being renovated, so Truman and his family were living around the corner in the Blair House. The two would-be assassins, Griselio Torresola and Oscar Colazzo, marched right up to the front door and started firing their guns. Predictably, neither of them got very far. Torresola was mortally wounded in the conflict, and Colazzo was sentenced to death, though in 1952, Truman arranged to have his near-killer's sentence changed to life imprisonment. The shocking death of John F. Kennedy in 1963 was one of the most traumatic events ever to hit the collective American psyche. While JFK was the last US president to be murdered while in office, he certainly wasn't the last one to face an assassination attempt. It was only a decade later that a former tire salesman named Samuel Bick tried to kill President Richard Nixon. Bike had previously protested outside the White House wearing a Santa Claus costume, and his grand plan was to hijack a commercial airliner and then force the pilots to crash it headfirst into the White House, hopefully killing Nixon. Bike's terrorist attack didn't make it too far. Before the plane could even take off, he was shot up by police and then took his own life. As for Nixon himself, he resigned later that year due to the infamous Watergate scandal. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Two assassination attempts would be scary enough, but Gerald Ford faced both of his in the same month. The first occurred in Sacramento on September 5th. Lynette Squeaky Fromm, a Charles Manson follower, was desperate to prevent what she perceived as an environmental threat to the California Redwoods and believed that she had to shoot Ford to make a statement. Fromm claimed to have gotten cold feet as soon as she saw Ford in person, but still raised the gun. The Secret Service rapidly restrained her before anything could happen, and Fromm was sentenced to life in prison. They're not going to let me go. A few weeks later, Ford was in San Francisco, when a former FBI informant named Sarah Jane Moore attempted to shoot him. Moore's attempt was stopped by a nearby Vietnam veteran, Oliver Sippel, who managed to throw off her aim. Secret Service agents hurled Ford into a vehicle before Moore could hit him. She was sentenced to the same West Virginia prison as Fromm, though both were later transferred to more secure facilities. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter was giving a Cinco de Mayo speech in Los Angeles, and he had no idea that hidden in the crowd was an unemployed drifter named Raymond Lee Harvey. Harvey was wielding a gun, but before the perpetrator could shoot, his suspicious demeanor caught the attention of Secret Service members who arrested him on the spot. Though Harvey was the one who got caught, it turned out he wasn't alone. According to Time, Harvey told the authorities that he was supposed to be one part of a four-man operation to kill Carter. Supposedly, 
Harvey's role was simply to shoot loudly enough to cause a distraction, while his partner finished the job with a sniper rifle. Charges against Raymond Lee Harvey were later dismissed due to lack of evidence. In 1976, a man named John Hinckley Jr. watched the film Taxi Driver and became dangerously fixated on actress Jodie Foster, who was 12 when she starred in the movie. Hinckley wrote letters to Foster, travelled to Connecticut in an attempt to see her, and even tried to call her on the phone. So, you just don't ever want me to call again? No. His obsession took an even darker turn when he decided that he wanted to kill the President of the United States for her. In 1980, Hinckley attempted to trail President Jimmy Carter, but was arrested for carrying his guns near a Carter campaign stop. Undeterred, Hinckley bought more guns. His obsession climaxed in 1981 when he tracked the new president, Ronald Reagan, to the Hilton Hotel in Washington. Hinckley unloaded a barrage of exploding bullets at Reagan. Though they didn't explode properly, one bullet pierced Reagan's chest and others wounded a Secret Service agent, a police officer, and press secretary James Brady. Reagan survived the shooting. The courts determined that Hinckley was insane and sentenced him to a mental hospital where he remained until his release in 2016. The original President George H.W. Bush made it through his four years without facing an assassination attempt, but that all changed after he retired. In April 1993, just three months after finishing his term, Bush took a trip to Kuwait. Soon afterward, 17 suspects were arrested on charges of attempting to assassinate the former president with a car bomb. Further investigation by the FBI determined that the suspects had not been acting alone, but were part of a covert operation directed by the Iraqi intelligence service. Seeing as Bush wasn't the president anymore, the official US response came from the new president Bill Clinton, who wasn't too happy about the incident. To make a point, Clinton decided to launch 23 cruise missiles at the Iraqi intelligence service headquarters in Baghdad. The missiles were specifically fired between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. to prevent the death of innocent civilians, though Iraq officials later stated that three houses had been destroyed, three people killed, and four injured. During his time in office, Bill Clinton made it through a few assassination attempts. The first incident occurred in September 1994, when a truck driver named Frank Eugene Corder attempted to pilot a small plane right into Clinton's White House bedroom, but instead crashed into one of Andrew Jackson's old magnolia trees. It's kind of a dramatic way to do things. Clinton also survived an eerier encounter in 1996. That year, Clinton was visiting Manila, and Osama bin Laden ordered his operatives to plant a bomb beneath a bridge that the presidential motorcade was scheduled to drive over. Just in time, Secret Service agents picked up a message regarding the bomb and rerouted Clinton's path to avoid it. Though bin Laden's involvement in the plot was soon uncovered, US officials opted to keep quiet on the matter until many years later. In May 2005, President George W. Bush stood beside Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili on a stage in the city of Tbilisi, Georgia. Bush was giving a speech when suddenly a grenade came flying toward him from the audience, but it didn't explode. As explained by the FBI, the grenade was live, but the attacker had wrapped it up so tightly in a red handkerchief that the firing pin wasn't able to deploy. The attacker escaped, but was tracked down a few months later and found to be a local Tbilisi man named Vladimir Arutyunian. The would-be assassin was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Being the first black president of the United States, Barack Obama received more death threats than most public figures. However, there were three specific assassination attempts that made headlines. The first one occurred in 2009, when President Obama attended the Alliance of Civilizations Summit in Istanbul. A Syrian man was arrested for carrying fake press credentials, and the man confessed that he'd been planning to stab Obama with a knife. Things got a lot weirder in 2011, when a young man named Oscar Ortega Hernandez attacked the White House with an assault rifle. Ortega Hernandez described himself as the modern-day Jesus Christ and believed it was his holy mission to kill Obama, whom he deemed the Antichrist. He was later sentenced to 25 years in prison.
I am the modern-day Jesus Christ that you all have been waiting for. The strangest story happened in 2013, when typewritten letters were sent to Obama containing a suspicious substance. This substance was soon found to be ricin, a deadly poison. An Elvis impersonator named Paul Kevin Curtis was arrested and charged, but was found innocent. Charges instead fell upon Curtis's online rival, James Dutchkey, whom Curtis said had framed him. The bizarre story ended with Dutchkey being sentenced to 25 years in prison. During his 2017 to 2021 presidential term, and his third presidential campaign in 2024, Donald Trump faced four assassination attempts. When the president paid a visit to the Andiva Mandan refinery in North Dakota in September 2017, Gregory Lee Leingang gained access to a secure area and tried to use a forklift to turn over the presidential vehicle while Trump was inside it. The forklift got stuck before he could get to the president's motorcade, and Leingang was apprehended after fleeing. In the fall of 2018, William Clyde Allen III attempted to kill President Trump by mailing him letters containing ground caster seeds which contain the biotoxin ricin. Another would-be assassin, Canadian Pascal Ferrier, mailed a ricin-loaded letter to President Trump in 2020. On both occasions, the envelopes were intercepted by authorities before Trump could handle them. In July 2024, Former President Donald Trump was on stage during a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, when a sudden and shocking incident occurred. As he addressed the crowd, gunshots rang out, causing immediate chaos and alarm. Take a look at what happened, Trump said, grabbing at his bleeding ear, apparently struck by a projectile. He slowly fell to the ground as members of his Secret Service protective detail rushed the stage to shield him from further harm. Law enforcement officers and Secret Service agents sprang into action, opening fire toward the source of the attack in an attempt to neutralize the threat. Amidst the pandemonium, Secret Service agents quickly moved Trump to an armored vehicle to ensure his safety. The situation was tense, but Trump was immediately declared to be okay after the shooting, much to the relief of his supporters and security personnel. The Associated Press reported that Secret Service agents killed the assailant, who was found on the roof of a building more than 140 yards away from the rally site. The precision and distance from which the shots were fired indicated a level of planning and calculation by the attacker. In addition to the alleged gunman, one rally attendee was also killed, adding to the tragedy of the event. The rally, which was intended to be a display of support and solidarity for Trump, quickly turned into a scene of terror and tragedy. The crowd, initially enthusiastic and energized, was thrown into panic and confusion as the sounds of gunfire erupted. People scrambled for cover, unsure of where the shots were coming from or how many attackers there might be. Secret Service agents demonstrated their training and preparedness by swiftly forming a protective barrier around Trump, using their bodies and specialized equipment to shield him from potential harm. Their quick response likely saved his life and prevented further casualties. Once Trump was safely inside the armored vehicle, the agents conducted a thorough sweep of the area to ensure there were no additional threats. Law enforcement agencies, including local police and federal investigators, immediately launched an investigation into the shooting. They worked to identify the shooter, understand the motives behind the attack, and determine if there were any accomplices involved. The scene was cordoned off, and evidence was meticulously collected to piece together the events leading up to and following the shooting. The incident prompted a wave of reactions from across the political spectrum. Supporters of Trump expressed outrage and demanded swift justice for the perpetrator, while critics highlighted the intense and often divisive nature of political rallies. The attack also raised questions about security measures at large public events and the challenges of protecting high-profile figures in an era of heightened political tensions. In the days following the shooting, Trump addressed the nation, expressing his gratitude to the Secret Service and law enforcement for their bravery and quick action. He also extended condolences to the family of the rally attendee who lost their life and emphasized the need for unity and resilience in the face of violence. The shooting in Butler, Pennsylvania, 
served as a stark reminder of the potential dangers faced by public figures and the importance of vigilance and preparedness. It also underscored the need for continued dialogue and efforts to address the root causes of political violence and ensure the safety of all citizens, regardless of their political affiliations. As the investigation progressed, more details emerged about the shooter and their possible motives. Authorities conducted interviews, reviewed surveillance footage, and analysed forensic evidence to build a comprehensive understanding of the incident. The findings were shared with the public, providing transparency and accountability in the aftermath of the tragedy. The rally shooting left a lasting impact on the community of Butler and the broader political landscape. It became a topic of national conversation, prompting discussions about security, political rhetoric, and the measures needed to prevent similar incidents in the future. While the immediate threat was neutralised, the broader implications of the attack continued to resonate, shaping the discourse around public safety and political engagement in the months and years to come. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.